Now, if you've seen my work, you've probably noticed that I don't usually go for the very tight, very symmetrical flowers, but there was something that was drawing me to forget-me-nots lately, and when I found the reference photo that I'm going to share with you today, I knew I had to paint them. And I loved that I was able to kind of play with a couple of different colors in order to really make these flowers something special. To start off this painting, I am gonna be working on this Legion Stonehenge paper. This is a new to me cold press, 100% cotton paper. And spoiler alert, I actually really love it. I received it as a gift from a girlfriend of mine and uh, she just wanted me to be able to test it out and I really do enjoy it. I already have the illustration sketched on there and if you would like help with your illustration, you can either take my flower drawing challenge, which I'll have linked down below, or you can just purchase the illustration. I have it in a black and white version or a grayscale version, which is a little bit easier to paint on. I will have that as well as my other painting templates linked down below. Now to lighten the illustration, which is why you can hardly see it, I used my kneaded eraser and I just kind of ran over the top of it and that lightened it so that it is not very dark. I'm working with my basic color palette from my beginner kit. So I have a warm and a cool version of red, yellow, and blue. I did consider using sap green, but I ended up going without it and just challenging myself to work with this limited palette. I'll be mixing ultramarine blue and cerulean blue to kind of get that perfect forget-me-not blue. I did also decide to add a little bit of red when I played around with alizarin crimson and cadmium red. I wasn't sure which one I wanted to do. Um, spoiler, I ended up going with the warmer red and just kind of adding a little bit of that to the blues in order to get just that little bit of that purple hint. Now that my initial color is mixed, I'm just gonna go through on each of the petals and do a slight wash. Now when I do a first pass, which is just kind of the first layer of paint, I keep it very light, but I am trying to decide kind of overall hue and overall value. So I'm establishing where the color is gonna go, but I'm also kind of making it a little bit darker or a little bit lighter where there's going to be either a highlight or a shadow. Um, now this is real time right now. I will be speeding up later on because I just wanna respect your time. I am a very slow painter. Now one problem that I run into when you work with a limited color palette is that occasionally it can get kind of boring or stale. So one thing that I like to do is to add in an unexpected color into the mix, especially if it is already in the mixture of color. So here I'm taking a little bit of red that is already mixed in with the full color that I'm using throughout this whole petal, but I'm adding it in a saturated amount to little areas on the petals. And you're gonna see me do this throughout the entire painting. It just adds a little bit of interest and a little bit of something special and unexpected. And like I said, with my first pass, I do like to add that little bit of shadow. And so you can see I'm doing wet on wet techniques, which is very typical for me for a first pass, where I'm applying a little bit of the color where there will be a shadow. So it kind of makes my job a little bit easier after the first pass because I've already done a lot of the footwork. I've already kind of established where the shadows are going to be, figured out some of those problems, and I've already kind of made it... Um, I don't wanna say stupid proof, but it is a little bit stupid proof <laughs> where when I'm doing later passes, I can kind of check out and be in therapy mode a little bit more. This is sped up by the way. Um, and I'm able to just kind of relax and work quickly and um, follow instinct a little bit more because the shadows are already mapped out for me. Now you'll notice for this pass, I might using for this specific petal, not this pass, I'm using a little bit more of that blue. Well, then I have to go in and add that little bit of red in. Um, and I like to have that little bit of variance with these petals. I decided to kind of do a couple petals that were a little bit more purpley toned and a couple that were a little more blue. Again, this is just a way that I can kind of play with the color palette, play with the fact that these flowers aren't very complicated in their shape and add a little bit of that visual interest. Now I did wanna jump ahead to this part in the painting because I wanted to show you firsthand where it was like really obvious how I do different values and amount of pigmentation in my first pass in order to kind of start showing that depth. So the petal, you can only see a little bit of it right on top of the one that I'm currently working on is significantly darker. That petal is in shadow and if you look at the reference photo that I'll have linked down below, that is in shadow so you know it's kind of pushing it back and that is one of the reasons that i really kind of work on just value and overall hue so whether i'm going for something a little bit warmer a little bit icier um, that's what i'm working on for my first pass 
but then also really establishing that value. Here's a side view so you can kind of see what I'm working with and how the paper, there's not a lot of water sitting on the paper. I get asked a lot about how much water to use. Um, I like it to look damp and have kind of that glossy effect for a while, but I never want any water sitting on my paper or very rarely do I want it to have that look. So there's a little bit kind of at the tip of my brush, but you see it fades very quickly and kind of blends in with that larger section of water that I have there. Now, if you've never painted flowers with me before, I would like to extend a special invitation to you. These flowers were actually created as part of a collaboration with Inktober um, for Gardentober, which is kind of my personal spin-off of Inktober. And if you're not familiar with Inktober, it's just a drawing challenge kind of thing that artists do every October. Um, and usually they focus on ink and there's a list of prompts that you can follow every single day. So for example, this year on the 18th, the prompt is moon. Um, so you could draw anything that inspire you know, you get inspired by, by listening to the word moon. Now for me, um, usually the prompts are kind of spooky and I'm not really a spooky Halloween-y type of girl. So I decided a couple of years ago with a couple of friends to do Flowertober, which eventually morphed into Gardentober. And Gardentober has been where we stuck. So every single prompt has a garden theme, whether it is a literal flower like Forget-Me-Nots today, October 1st, or when, I'm, when this video goes live, <laughs> Or it is something that is a little bit more creative and a little bit more vague, like dew or harvest. And so I'm really excited to see what everybody comes up with. It's just a fun challenge that um, whether you participate in one day or you participate in multiple days um, and just kind of pushing yourself creatively. For me personally, last year I found that I was pushed to tell a story with each of my pieces and I didn't start the challenge with this intent. But looking back, I was like, wow, I grew so much in just my storytelling with flowers of all things. And so it ended up being a lot of fun. I do, again, this challenge every single year. It's just a spinoff of something that already exists. I'm not the beginner of Gardentober or beginner of Inktober. I did start Gardentober. Um, but I am really excited to you know, continue to do this and spin it off again. If it's not October, you're watching this um, not when it first goes out, I will still invite you to look at the prompt list that I'll have linked down below or to kind of look out for this coming year because if, you know, if it's September, I'm already getting ready for the next year's prompt list. I work on this all year long. Sometimes I'll have co-hosts uh, this particular year. I do not, um, but it's always a lot of fun. I always make a ton of friends. And it's just a great opportunity to push ourselves and to grow and to get to know other artists. So again, I will have all the details for that link down below. Whether you're on social media or not, it is a great opportunity to grow as an artist. All right, we're jumping ahead a little bit more. I'm going to show you real quickly one way that I'm softening this flower a little bit. So forget-me-nots have like this V, this white V coming out from the center of each of their petals. In order to get a very soft transition, I'm going in with a clean brush. So this is a damp brush, there's no pigment on it. It is still a little bit wet, but I'm using it to kind of soften the edge. I'm just running it along the edge so that there's not that hard line. It doesn't look like, you know, I, it's not very crisp. It's very softened. And I love that effect on these flowers. I think that it adds a little bit of more organic beauty where in many ways, these are very calculated, um, very, geometric flower because everything is so symmetrical and the same um, but that little bit of that soft color and that soft kind of coming out helps to add that little feminine touch um, that little bit of organic element and so I did really want to make sure that with each of the petals I'm keeping that white space nice and soft. As I'm continuing my way up the flower and um, kind of just working on different buds and stuff, I'm not following anything, you know, like any set pattern for when I'm adding the red or when I'm doing something a little bit more blue. It's not like every third petal make it more blue. I'm really just letting that be therapeutic. Now, one trick with these little buds is to go through and see how I'm picking up some of the paint. I have a 
brush that's been dried off a little bit and I picked up some paint in that center area and that will allow it to kind of have that round effect where there's that highlight in the middle and so to us it looks kind of more like a ball. Um, so I'm not focusing on them too much because I do want even their highlights to be, have this blue tone. Um, but see, I'm picking that up right there. Yep. And um, I'm just going to continue to go through and add some shadows. But the, especially the one, the buds that are a little bit larger, I wanted to make sure that they had that little bit of highlight that I was picking up. I'm still going to be following the same pattern that I've been doing where I'll add a little bit of red sometimes, or I'll make it a little bit more blue, or I'll make it a little darker if it needs to be more in shadow. Um, but again, this is just mostly coming from me looking at my reference image and trying to decide, you know, like how to represent that best, but then also looking at my painting as a whole. The wonderful thing about art and painting is that you can kind of decide what goes. Um, you don't necessarily have to be a slave to your reference image, especially if you're doing something just for fun. Once my first pass is completed and dried, I believe this was actually the second day. You don't have to wait that long. I just get a limited amount of time to paint during nap time. But once the first pass is completed, I'm going to go through and start adding some more details. And the first thing I'm going to focus on, really what I find the easiest, is looking for those shadows. So I'm looking at my reference image and I'm looking for blocks of shape or color that indicate a shadow. And this will really bring some life to your painting. It will help petals that are forward to kind of pop off the page and actually come forward. Now, one thing I do want to mention, I am working with new filming equipment after, let's see, how long have I been doing this? Three years of filming for YouTube. I finally decided to invest in a camera and some audio equipment. So if you're thinking, oh, her audio sounds weird or the camera's not focusing right, I'm still learning. This is my first full video working with the camera, my first tutorial filmed with the camera, my first time trying to do audio um, on top of what I've already filmed. And so there is a little bit of, I'm having a little bit of trouble. So sometimes it'll focus on my hand. Sometimes it'll focus on the painting like it's supposed to. It's just a learning curve. If you think that this quality is so much better and you're happy with it, I would be thrilled to know because I just spent a ton of money. <laughs> but I would love to hear your feedback or if you have any tips or if there's something that you found kind of annoying, I'll work on kind of fixing those. I'm trying to get this kind of perfected so that for my actual courses, I can really up the quality for you. Um, but do know, I do see when it goes out of focus and I am trying to fix that for you guys. Um, I just can't paint and watch the camera at the same time. But I am very excited about this. I'm excited to be able to offer you guys better quality, hopefully better videos along with it, and um, just a better experience overall. Um, but again, back to the actual painting, <laughs> I am just working on adding those shadows. And just like with the first pass, sometimes the shadows are a little bit more blue tone, and sometimes they're a little bit more on the purpley side, especially when I want something to be pushed back into the background, like it's really far back, like the flower on the lower left hand side, um, not the one that I'm working on right now, I will be going in with a more blue tone. Cooler tones automatically are pushed away from the viewer's eyes. Um, that's just kind of some art psychology for you. Cooler tones are pushed away while warmer tones appear to come forward a little bit more. And so if you're not sure if you're like, oh, I don't know what color to paint this petal. Well, think to yourself, is it something that I need to fall in the background or is it something that I want to come forward? This isn't a hard and fast rule, but it's a, one way that you can kind of, it can help you decide to use art and art therapy and art theory to your advantage. Now I'm gonna go through and I'm doing the same thing on these little buds. So I'm working on the shadows. I'm kind of jumping around. That's just kind of what I like to do and I'm adding the little bit of shadows. You're not gonna be using a ton of pigment here, but you are gonna kind of define the space. Once I have a little bit of that paint down, I'm cleaning off my brush, and so it's just damp, and I'm just kind of softening everything. I don't want there to be a ton of detail on these little buds. I just want you to see that they're made up of multiple petals. It's not like a little toy ball on the end of this. This is going to be a flower someday. Now, if you've taken my botanical course or my flower drawing mini course, 
you know that I believe in using the reference image to your advantage, especially if you get stuck. Now, when I get stuck, I will pull the reference image up on my phone. You can see right now in this footage, I'm looking for it. I normally have the reference image on my computer, which is a little bit farther away, but I'll have it on my phone next to me when I have trouble, and I try and use that to get exactly what I want. And so it's very close. It's not hard for me to kind of look back and forth between the two. We as humans are not designed to remember every single detail. We just can't. That's why people who have photographic memories are so special and unique because they're able to do that and the rest of us aren't. So don't feel bad if you're not able to create something from memory or from your imagination. That's not really how we were designed to do and definitely not you know, being able to paint flowers from our imagination when we haven't studied them a lot. Um, so give yourself a break, pull up the reference image. If you need to use the painting template, go ahead and grab that. Again, that'll be linked down below. I try to keep the price extremely affordable so that um, anybody who needs to have the extra help of the um, illustration can access that. So continue to use the reference image. Don't be afraid to kind of pull things in and make it easy on yourself. Don't get frustrated if you can't do what you weren't designed to do in the first place. All right, now that we have kind of our first and second pass down, I'm going to start adding in the yellow. I'm starting with lemon yellow. The yellow for the forget-me-nots is a very light, pale, cool-toned yellow. But to add a little bit of depth, because there are areas that I'm going to want it to be a little darker, I am mixing in a little bit of the cadmium yellow, but it really what ended up happening is I decided to mix in a little bit of that cadmium red. Um, so basically I'm using all of my warm and cool colors and just kind of mixing them together to get kind of the neutral tone. Um, but for the most part, I will be using the lemon yellow. And just like previously, I'm gonna be doing an initial pass and kind of trying to tap in a little bit of color, but it will be after I've kind of applied it. So you'll see that I'll apply the yellow here to the center area of the forget-me-nots. I almost forgot what color, what the name of the flower we're working on. The forget-me-nots, how ironic the name. Um, I'm gonna add that initial pass. You'll see I'll kind of go through and I'll move the paint around and go back and forth between them. Because this color is so light, um, it, I want to be very careful and delicate. I am using a much smaller brush. Let me grab it and see what size it is. It's a size three. It's a Princeton Heritage brush. Um, it's new to me and I really love it. I used it quite a bit in my recent uh, male Oriole uh, painting and used it for the flowers as well and some of those details. I've really been enjoying it. Um, you know that I really like my Princeton Neptune brushes, the watercolor brushes, but those are way, those are a lot thirstier. And so if you're a beginner, I recommend checking out the Heritage. They're not as difficult to control because they don't hold quite as much water. Anyway, back to the tutorial. Um, if you were watching closely, you probably noticed that I picked up some of the more warmer tone yellow, um, which is towards the top of kind of that large yellow mixture. And I'm using that to kind of add a shadow. Um, just because warmer tone yellows are naturally a little bit more deeper and a little bit richer than the cooler tone yellow, which is, um, I mean, it's probably about as close as to white as you can get. And so um, I'm using that, so adding that little bit of the cadmium yellow, mixing it in with the lemon yellow, and then using that to add the shadows or to kind of add areas where I think need a little bit more definition or a little bit more depth. But again, keeping it very light. That's one of the reasons I'm not using one of the Neptune brushes for this because those hold quite a lot of pigment and quite a lot of water. So with something like this that I want to be very delicate, I'm just at, you know, barely kind of just dancing my brush on the page. And so to do that, I don't want there to be a ton of pigment on my brush. Now, in order to do the center, I decided to just kind of fill it in with the yellow altogether, but I did this after with just kind of a glaze. So it's just a light, light wash of pigment um, in order to, and I did that after I kind of defined the space of the other yellow areas. 
Now I'm adding ultramarine now to the yellow tones that I had already mixed together in order to start creating the green that will be for the stem and kind of the leaves that you can kind of see. I thought about using sap green, which if you have seen my beginner color palette tutorial um, or video, whatever it's called, um, you'll know that I love sap green. And I really think that after you kind of buy your beginner set, sap green is a fabulous addition. But I decided to push myself and see if I could get the kind of green that I was going for um, on my own. Um, so I've obviously had to do this before in art school, um, but I really wanted to kind of play around with it again and just give myself this little bit of a test. So I'm basically mixing yellow and blue together, which will make a green tone. I was using ultramarine and lemon yellow, which are both cool tone blues. Um, and then I added a little bit of the cadmium red, mostly because those are the three primary tones that we have been using, the three primary hues. And so um, I'm kind of using those together. The red will help to desaturate the green tone a little bit so it won't be too bright because we have this bright yellow and we have this in a brighter, um, very attention grabbing blue tone for the flowers. I wanted to make sure that the green was very muted. I don't, you don't want too many things that are too bright. Um, really those desaturated deeper tones are what can make a painting because it helps the viewer to automatically see what the focal point is. And I'm using just a, the back of this painting. <laughs> um, normally I'd use just a scrap piece of paper, but since I was testing the paper out anyway, I decided to just go for it. Um, and I'm kind of weighing those colors against each other. So I have the blue tone that I mixed for the flowers already um, next to the green and I'm just kind of seeing, okay, I went way too, I had too much red, so it's way too brown. So I'm adding in more of the yellow and more of the blue just to try and get the green tone that I want. Um, and it is harder to see. Sometimes it's like, oh, that looks just like straight gray. But when it's with the flowers, um, it does have more of a green undertone and I promise it'll look good. <laughs> So this did take a lot of back and forth, and honestly, if I had used the cadmium yellow, it might have been a little bit faster, but I just kind of wanted to push myself and to play around a little bit more. Um, so don't get frustrated if you feel like you're mixing and mixing and mixing. Um, sometimes you just gotta find that right, perfect balance, and eventually you'll get it, and you'll be able to start kind of filling things in. So I'm switching over to my number six round brush. Again, this is a Princeton Neptune brush, um, primarily what I use and I'm going to start in on the first pass. Oh no, it's not in focus. Um, the first pass of this, the stem basically, and kind of the first bit of greenery. So just like my first pass for everything else, I'm going to be kind of doing a subtle wash of color and then adding a little bit of depth where there needs to be some shadows and that will be just by kind of tapping more of the pigment in. Because these brushes hold quite a bit of water and pigment, um, I don't have to go back for a lot of you know, like back and pick up more paint. I'm able to just kind of work with what I have on my brush, tap that in, go back, pick up a little bit more, um, but I'm able to like work quite a bit. Oh, I'm so sorry, guys. Hopefully you can tell what I'm doing. I'm really doing what we've done throughout this whole painting. And if you've watched my tutorials, this is just how I paint. I'm just kind of tapping in that extra color. Now you'll see that that color is very desaturated. Um, you could go with a brighter green. I just wouldn't go too, too bright um, because you wanna make sure that, again, it's not competing with the bright yellow centers or that beautiful blue tone that you got. But you can see like it doesn't look like, um, you know, like a dead stem or anything like that. Um, so it's just, it's very light. I, in person, it looks more green <laughs> than it does right here. Um, I'm assuming that's just because there is the sap green in the shot um, and the viridian green, but I promise it's, it's subtle, but it is good to have something that is just more desaturated to kind of create that hierarchy and um, not make it so that everything in your painting is competing with the others. And here you can see that I'm adding a little bit of red to um, the stems. And I, again, I'm mixing that with the green color that I already have, so it will help to desaturate it and to make it a little bit darker. Using the Heritage brush again, because it doesn't carry a ton, and so I'm able to kind of just tap that in without worried being, you know, having to worry about it overwhelming the painting quickly. 
and this is wet on wet. So I worked very quickly in order to make sure that the initial pass was still wet in order to kind of tap that in and have that to fade nicely. So I don't have to like worry about making the proper shapes. Everything's gonna kind of fade in the way that I need it to. And because your girl loves a limited color palette, I'm gonna use the same color for the center of the forget-me-nots. I was really torn about how to do this because I've looked at different reference images, not just the image that I'll have down below, um, but just different pictures of forget-me-not flowers. And the centers were not always consistent. Um, so I decided to just add a simple wash of this neutral tone, um, use it to kind of define the space, you know, tap in a little extra to create that shadow that I wanted to, um, but I didn't want it to be kind of a focal point. So I didn't want to add too much detail. In the reference image, you'll notice that there's almost like little yellow spheres in the center um, surrounded by this darker tone, but I decided to just kind of simplify it because I don't want those to become the focal point. I want it to be, you know, the color variations in the petals themselves and just kind of the visual interest already created by the flowers, by the arc of, you know, the buds that are preparing to bloom rather than it being the center of the flower. If you want to do that, go for it. Um, I'm sure it would still be beautiful, but for me, I just decided less was more. The babies were going to wake up soon. Um, and I still wanted to be able to get this out to you. So I just decided to keep it simple. Um, it would still look like a forget me not, but still, um, not take too much time. But see how I'm just kind of, I'm going in, I'm filling in that space moving on to the next one. And then while it is still wet, I will return and add a little bit of that pigment. I don't want it to be too wet or the paint will spread too much. Um, and I won't be able to get that defined shadow that you can see on the lowest forget me not right now. You can kind of see how there's that shadow there. Um, but I want to kind of define that space a little bit more. So I can soften the edge with a clean brush if it's not blending in quite as much as I want to, can pick up with that clean brush, or I can tap in the color like I tend to do, <laughs> tap in the extra color, which is probably what I'll do right now, and um, get that as dark as I want it to go. So see, just tap, 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 and that will blend in beautifully. And right around now, I would say that I consider this painting pretty much finished. I went through and added, you know, like deepened some of my shadows a little bit, um, but my camera died. <laughs> so I don't necessarily have that to show you. I came back the next day and honestly, I wasn't in love with how it was going. Um, I felt like it just felt unfinished, like there was too much negative space. I didn't really want to add a leaf where that arch was because I liked the arch but it still felt like it needed something. So I ended up adding a background wash to the entire piece. Now, obviously this wasn't planned. This is recorded on my phone. I just wanna show you what I'm doing. I'm basically taking the dirty water that was left over from painting this and I'm adding it a little bit into the background. Um, and then I'm just kind of putting it in these little crevices and details. I'm trying to be not super precise, um, but not so messy that it kind of looks like it doesn't fit. I want it to look like the background, almost like, you know, you took a portrait with a shallow depth of field. And so there's no focus on the flowers and stuff in the background, but I still wanted it to be kind of that beautiful color palette. So I did go through and I would tap in a little bit of extra blue if I needed to. Um, in different areas, but I'm mostly working with kind of the dirty water. So see how I'm just kind of like adding that in a little bit, and then I'll take a little bit of water and I'll soften the edge and kind of pull that out. Again, I'm sorry you can't see this very well. It wasn't a planned part of the tutorial. My camera had died, and so I'm just working with what I've got. But I'm taking the water and I'm just, as when I'm taking it as clean as I can get it, and I'm taking it around the edge to kind of soften it, and that will have that beautiful fade where most of the color is concentrated towards the flowers, towards the center, um, but you can still kind of see it everywhere else. 
So again, tap, tap, tapping that more concentrated dirty color. And again, most of this is what we used for the stem. And so we'll have kind of that consistent green tone in here. And I'm just tapping that in that kind of the tiny details that are closest to the center of the flower so that the color will fade nicely. Um, I don't want there to be kind of a harsh edge. I want it to look very intentional and, um, you know, like look like part of the flower, not like something was added. And then this was the finished result. You can see that kind of the dirty water helps to fade um, and the colors separate a little bit because I have a lot of granular colors in there, but I actually love the overall effect. Um, so I'm really happy that I ended up adding this background wash and I hope that you give it a try too. If you're interested in purchasing the illustration to paint along with me, I will have that linked down below. And until next time, happy painting.